Although their name may not be as instantly recognizable today as some of their peers, the Fonestocks were pivotal figures in New York's high society. Hi everyone, Ken here. As we explore the many opulent mansions of the Fonestock family, let me know your favorites in the comment section as we go through them. Born in 1835, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Harris C. Fonestock laid the foundations of the family fortune. Starting out working at a young age for his uncle's bank, his exceptional aptitude for finance saw him quickly ascend the ranks. By the age of 27, he had become a partner at J. Cook & Company in Washington, D.C., and was rubbing shoulders with the likes of President Lincoln, whom he advised financially. When the company collapsed, he moved to the First National Bank of New York, where he served as the vice president for four decades and later founded the investment firm Bonnestock & Company. His business acumen, including shrewd investments in railroads and directorships in various firms, amassed great wealth, which he passed on to his six children. The Fonestock's architectural influence started when Harris and his wife Margaret moved the family to Manhattan. They initially settled in a posh townhouse in Murray Hill at 292 Madison Avenue. Yet, ambition and opportunity led them ten blocks north to the stunning Villard houses. These six cohesive townhouses, designed by the renowned architecture firm of McKim, Mead & White, were ambitious projects initiated by Henry Villard. Financial troubles halted their construction, but Harris saw potential. He bought two adjoining townhouses with grand plans to combine them into a single, monumental home. Though covenants prevented his dream merger, Harris and his son William made the townhouses their homes, and the designs by McKim, Mead & White were brought to life. Furthermore, Harris built impressive country houses both in Long Branch, New Jersey, and, more humbly, a beachfront cottage in Bar Harbor, Maine. As the 20th century dawned, the subsequent Fonestock generation would leave even more significant imprints on society. Gibson commissioned Nathan Wyeth, a distinguished Washington architect, to create a Beaux-Arts masterpiece on Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C. This mansion became the epicenter of Washington's elite social events and now serves as the Embassy of Haiti. For his daughter Helen, Harris purchased and renovated another unit in the Villard House. Its grand halls were still adorned with Victorian-era detailing, with the dining room reaching towards a double-height barrel-vaulted ceiling. No finish was too expensive for his daughter, whether she wanted parquet floors and marble fireplace surrounds, or an ancient bedroom set salvaged from a European nobleman's house. It was all done exactly to her taste. And when she was not in the city, she could be found summering at her Dutch Revival-style country house in the Hudson Highlands. Harris Fonestock's other children weren't far behind in leaving their mark. After Harris' death in 1914, they invested their inheritance in magnificent architectural projects. Harris Fonestock Jr., for example, acquired two brownstones at East 66th Street and transformed them into a majestic Beaux-Arts mansion. The interior was finished out with limestone columns and artisan wrought iron in the entryway, where a sweeping, grand staircase dramatically rose from the shadows below an opulent skylight. The dining room was meant to impress, with antique European furniture mixed with classically styled architecture. The library reflected the refined taste of the era, with half-height bookcases below family portraits. And in the ballroom, modeled after Palladian design, gilded plasterwork sparkled in the light of the crystal chandelier. The children all went on to build grand country estates. Each was completed with carefully planned gardens and expansive lawns. The interiors, while much larger than their Manhattan homes, were no less grand. Libraries were finished out in rich wood paneling with built-in bookshelves, and drawing rooms were designed to impress, with grand Georgian detailing in their upper mantles. The family had a cohesive style, which incorporated old-world charm with turn-of-the-century modern sophistication. Tragedy struck during World War I, when Dr. Clarence Fonestock, a physician and a war volunteer, succumbed to the Spanish flu in France. His home at 457 Madison Avenue was later acquired and merged by his brother William with his house next door in the 1920s. The resulting townhouse was nothing less than majestic, with a wide entry hall clad in wood paneling. We see this motif continue into the dining room, and further yet, carrying into the drawing room, hung with antique European tapestries. In the library, the paneling was adorned with intricate relief work depicting fruiting vines, though, Unlike many libraries of the time, its bookshelves were left mostly empty. The Fonestock's homes stood as testaments to their influence during the Gilded Age, 
Their architectural contributions provided an aesthetic that resonated with the period's essence. Today, while none of their homes remain in the family, a handful of these majestic structures and their intricate exteriors and interiors endure, reminding us of a bygone era of grandeur and the mostly forgotten Von Stock family that played a crucial role in shaping the social norms of New York's high society. Which house was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section, and while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.